and welcome to this Trader Talk TV. Uh, again, today we're virtual because we're still in the midst of COVID, but today we've got Pierre from Lodemy. Pierre, how are you doing? Doing well. Thank you, Aaron. Where are you, where are you coming for us today? Are you in New York? Yes, New York City, the 15th floor of 35th Street and 30, or excuse me, 35th and 9th Avenue. So I, I look at the entrance of Lincoln Tunnel and I look at the Freedom Tower there. Well, we can't see that, unfortunately, but uh, clearly great views from, from your vantage point. Great views, great views. Yeah. Today we're going to do this. This is actually quite unique because we've actually got a real live whiteboard in someone else's office and we're doing this virtually, which is kind of cool. Um, so today we're talking about privacy centric user identification in a post cookie world and panorama ID. Obviously, this is relating to our shift from sort of the cookie based world uh, to a privacy first world. And we're talking about all of the factors involved in there. So Pierre, before we jump into the discussion, because there's quite a lot to, to discuss today, just give us an overview of what you do at Lodemy and what Lodemy are doing right now in, in the marketplace. What do I do at Lodemy? Uh, well, okay, what Lodemy does is we are uh, a data connectivity solution for the open web. We provide first, second, and third party data solutions to our publisher and brand clients. So we sit between both parts of the digital advertising ecosystem and we enrich both sides of, of, of the marketplace with, uh, with audience data. So we have an audience management solution uh, as, long, as well as a data market seller and data market buyer solutions uh, to, to, to facilitate that. What do I do? Uh, I work here at, at Lodemy as a global partnerships lead. I come out of the product team uh, and I've moved into global partnerships because when it became apparent that we were going to have to figure out the open web uh, and, and Lodemy had a couple ideas about that, it made sense for a product team member to go out and start to interact more, uh, more robustly with our partners because we knew that it required uh, partnership uh, and, and really investing in, in the ecosystem, not just one man or you know everyone out for them, themselves kind of attitude. We needed to think uh, in a partnership strategy in order to, to build a, a solution for the open web. Okay. So, so we're going to kick off because we're at this interesting sort of juncture in, the, uh, in, in this sort of um, privacy debate. We've had uh, numerous sort of uh, um, legislation passed in Europe, around, particularly around GDPR. We've had legislation in California and the United States is a patchwork of state, uh, state legislation rather than federal. Uh, around the world, you have uh, different sort of legislation in Brazil, et cetera. So the state has been actively involved in, in, in sort of like shaping the privacy narrative. On top of that, we've had uh, platforms, particularly Apple, who have sort of almost weaponized privacy as a marketing tool and decided the rules of the state, rules of the game for most people who are actually using their platform. So we were talking about this before, it's almost like the nanny state has decided what's best for, for users. And then we feel there's a fork in the road here right now, that, that sort of that direction of heading down and letting big platforms and government decide what people want. Or the second fork is basically sort of creating a privacy first environment, but letting users be more in control of their own privacy settings. So actually taking more personal responsibility for the privacy instead of being told what to do. Very much a libertarian view of the world, if you will, but actually the, probably the best way to do it. I want to talk about the pros and cons of both, because obviously there are pros and cons because a lot of people wouldn't have the requisite skills to kind of figure out what their privacy rights are. Likewise, why should one company dictate what we should do when, our, when they are uh, obviously in, uh, with one hand trying to protect us and the other hand trying to basically build their own ad business. So I want to talk about the first one for, uh, uh, initially, which is, which is the, the nanny state approach. And for sure. any of you who don't know the nanny state approach is generally governments getting involved in how you run your life. It's a, it's a very um, popular phrase in this part of the world. Uh, American viewers have never heard of it. That's a, that's fine, but that, let's talk about that first, Pierre, and talk about the pros and cons of that specific strategy, and we'll go on to the other fork and road in a minute. Yeah, Kieran, thanks. That's that's exactly right. I, I see the same. I see it the same way, where we have these two attitudes about privacy. 
um, one that says, uh, I know exactly uh, what you want, user, and how to protect your uh, data. And you don't need to worry about all those complicated things. I'll take care of it for you. I would call that the walled garden approach. And then uh, the other approach is the open web, where we give users the tool to protect, control, uh, and audit their own uh, data and, 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 and build the tools for that. So uh, these, this is how I see the fork on the road. And honestly, we've seen a lot of our tech partners and, and tech entities making a decision to go one or the other way. I think anybody who's robustly involved in the IEB, for example, and building out standards would be more a proponent of the open web. Whereas folks who are building ad networks or shutting down their ID spaces to only have first party or you know, the various things that, that folks are doing, uh, I would say trade desk even, you know, we've got Google shutting down IDs entirely. You've got, as you mentioned, Apple um, and using uh, the, the privacy decisions to, to, to close their ecosystems and with privacy as the reason why. And we, we see a trend in those directions. And I would call out that it's not just Google and Apple. There's also big other players who are deciding to take this tack because it's useful to them and not necessarily the best route. So you said you wanted to tackle the, you wanted to talk about the pros and cons of, of this first one. Um, so yes, let's do that. I would say that the first pro, and I want you to obviously contribute here, the first pro would be easy, right? It's just super easy for brands uh, and, and, and users to take advantage of these wonderful tools that Google and Apple and others have created for them. You put money in as a marketer and you get money out uh, and they don't tell you how it works really, but they show you that it does. Uh, and they use all of the data that they've collected from your search results and your navigation history and all of those things to, pr to, to provide excellent results for their brand marketer and customers, and they make it very easy. The, only, the, the con, and I'd say the big con, is that it's totally unaccountable. You have no, uh, no accountability on how they do that. And Kieran, I don't know if you've been following uh, the, the congressional hearings here in the United States uh, around Facebook. Uh, but we have had a lot of really interesting news coming out of, of Facebook, who internally knew that they were doing things that weren't that were a bit untoward, but had decided not to take action to correct them. And that really proves to my mind that the walled garden approach, it, it, it facilitates or encourages a self-regulatory uh, kind of philosophy towards privacy, where the walled garden themselves decides, what privacy is in the first place and how to respect it slash manage it on behalf of users, but they only have to be accountable to themselves. And, and we end up in a space in which we don't really have any idea what they're doing with that with that data. Yeah, and also they, they also have an alternative uh, agenda. Um, Apple um, are, are building a fairly sizable ad business. And when they, uh, you know, when they put up their opt-in it was for you know third party uh, apps to sort of track, but they allowed people to not, they didn't show the same sort of uh, um, pop-ups for Apple related um, apps or the, the Apple device. And they were forced to actually do that because in GDPR you're, you have to do that anyway for, ad, um, for showing ads. So yeah. there's always a sort of a hidden agenda um, with wall gardens and, and obviously you know, can you trust, really trust the likes of Google who have a massive ad business to, to do what's right by the user or even uh, by, you know, the rest of the industry? Exactly. We, we don't know, you know, we, do we really want the board of Google and Apple deciding what to do with the data that mm -hmm. we've given them? Um, but I, I would just summarize what you just said in, in, in non-competitive, you know, by putting all of the revenue, you know, all, what is it, 80%? of new advertising revenue goes to Google every year. By building that kind of non-competitive environment in which one board of directors decides how the internet is going to work, uh, you know, doesn't facilitate innovation and it doesn't facilitate a competitive marketplace where ideas, the best idea will win, not just the best or most resourced idea. Um, you want to talk about the pros and cons of the yeah, open so web? Let's talk about the open web because that's an interesting one, right? Obviously a lot of the independent publishers uh, and independent ad tech act, uh, work in the open web. Uh, and it's very much about 
giving power to publishers to sort of dictate their own sort of um, you know their own destiny in terms of revenue. Um, but there is an interesting play around what can we put in terms of guardrails that users are aware of and they're aware of the risks. I wouldn't say risk, but aware of the environment they're working in and can opt out in 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 in, in any sort of uh, like at any at any stage of that process. So. I want to talk about the open web because it's an important uh, junction of the road. So let's talk about the pros initially about the open web. Yeah, for, for, for my sake, it's really easy to, to summarize the pros of the open web. Users win on the open web, in my view, um, because of all of the wonderful things that you and I have grown up enjoying uh, on the internet. You know, this open, ad supported, free service that you can go and get all sorts of information, uh, news. Uh, make friends. I mean, the internet has totally changed our lives and it's changed our lives basically free. We have, you know, you don't need to be a millionaire or go to a fancy school to take advantage of the, the incredible resources that are now available on the internet. And that's a great thing. That form of the open web that is ad supported and free is in danger. It is existentially threatened by the walled gardens who are beginning to build very specifically paywalls and various things in which you have to trade certain capabilities, certain opportunities uh, in order to, to be able to take advantage of this internet. They're essentially saying, hey, that internet that used to be everybody's, it's now ours and you've got to pay to enter. So I think users really benefit. Also, let's give users the benefit of the doubt and, tell them, and, and give them the tools to protect their own data. My son, he's seven, okay? The, the, the degree to which he understands technology is, is, is profound and he will only ever get better at it. And so the idea that we don't need to explain or don't need to give the tools to users for an accountable, transparent, open web because they can't handle it, it's just, it's just not based in fact. The young people coming up today know what's going on. They know how data is used and we should give them the tools to take uh, control of it. So I would say users win big time. You know, they get control. Uh, they get accountability, um, and, and they get transparency, which is the best part for me because I want to know what's going on in those walled gardens. These, these, you know, this product manager who just released twenty thousand internal memos and emails uh, because uh, it, it, you know, because she was morally compelled. Thank goodness. I mean, we are learning a lot about what Facebook was doing and how it's adversely affecting our world. And, and they would never have told us otherwise. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, it's uh, an openness that allows us to kind of keep track of people, uh, to track of, the, of bad behavior. Um, and what about the cons then here? I mean, obviously there are cons around, I suppose, infrastructure, um, your data right. use, there's a lot of stuff going on there as well. The cons are the, yeah, the, uh, what is it? The fractured nature of our of the internet. It is it is not. Um, it's 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 all over the world. Many many different countries. Many many different markets. And you know you made a good point, Kieran, at the top where we have like we have separate privacy law depending on the state you live in in the United States, uh, which makes for a very complex environment. And so I would say that the cons are a, a lack of standards. You know they're, they're, we need standards. We need to. The con is that it's not easy. I'll do that. I'll summarize it by saying it's not easy uh, because we're going to have to, as an ad tech community, as an internet community, as, as technologists, we're going to have to invest in standards, uh, in, 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 in regulations. I know that the libertarians, uh, the libertarian in you, Kieran, will probably not like that, but we're going to have to invest in some kind of regulatory uh, infrastructure to keep bad behaviors from acting Badly, um, and, and essentially just to, to, to bring it in line with what makes a healthy public space, uh, mm. the, the kind of thing that we've done for centuries to figure out how to make our public environments more safe for everybody. So yeah, we, it's not easy, I think is how I would summarize the cons for the open web. Yeah, interesting. So uh, so moving on then, it's interesting. So like talking about Lodomy uh, and their tech, I mean, we think about you guys sort of working in, in that open web ecosystem um it'd be interested to understand how your tech works within that sort of open web ecosystem and how it's helping users yeah so and, and how a company like yours is handling privacy because 
obviously that's a big uh, uh, touch, you know, big sort of uh, uh, area uh, of discussion within the industry right now. It's huge. I mean, it's the thing. I think you you would you would probably admit. So how do we do? We're we're investing in standardizations. So we're investing in PRAM and the IAB and pre-bid these these industry wide infrastructure. Uh, well, I guess it'd be sort of standardization movements. Um, and so I, I, our thing is built on the foundation of the IAB primarily. So what we're doing is we're saying the IAB, uh, IAB Europe in particular, because you're, you know, just to bring it into your region, have built the TCF 2.0 string, right? This concept that, that provides for privacy uh, signaling uh, across the ecosystem. And they've given us the tools upon which to build. They haven't solved everything, and, and it's certainly not done, but it is the tools upon which we're building our foundational, uh, the foundations of what we're doing. So the IB tools, then we have the publishers who are building um, the wonderful websites that we all enjoy and know and love. Um, and then we've got this roof that we interact with, uh, which is pre-bid. So pre-bid is a, uh, a technology layer in the header of a, of a publisher page. And it does a bunch of things before the page loads. It does it does a bunch of things. It takes care of a lot of the uh, various uh, parts of advertising technology that we need. It it, it makes sure that everybody understands uh, whether this is a fraudulent or non fraudulent website or or ad request or bid request. It does a lot of, of, of great. Um, it, it does a lot of things organizing for the publishers the, the various things they need to signal upstream. And Prebid has a GDPR module that reads the TCF string when the page load opens. And so the publisher asks for consent for Lodomy using the IAB tools. It passes that IAB string into Prebid. Prebid checks whether that's okay, uh, that, that the Lodomy user ID module, which is embedded in Prebid can fire. And then we do fire and Lodomy adds what our value is. I said, we're a dated connectivity company we add enrichment. So we add third party, first and second and third party data components, attributes to the user uh, as it comes through pre-bid, which can be leveraged by the publisher to increase yield for their inventory or leveraged by marketers to add more relevancy to their targeting. And then we put, then that all gets pushed up into the bid stream for marketers. The point I'm making here is that IAB has given the tools to publishers and Lodomy to use pre-bid to make sure we have consent and consent flows up into the rest of the marketplace. So for those of you who don't know how TCF works, every single vendor who is a signatory in good standing has a, has a number and the, the, the user is given a notification saying, do you permit this vendor to do the thing they wanna do? And that user can say yes or no. It is a very complicated tool, but it is in the user's hands to do so. And it really makes my point of, sure, it's not easy, but users do have accountability, transparency, and control of their data. They can decide whether or not to let us do what we want to do. They do permit us, and then we add our enrichment layer, push it up into the stream, and then, you know, basically we facilitate money from brand marketers to go to all of the people in the ecosystem through a consented framework. So we keep the open web ad supported and free, and that's how it works. Um, what is the Lodomy Parameter Framework? Um, means just to get an idea of how you know, you work with partners to make this possible. Because obviously you're talking about, you know, the open web will have many, many players involved, right? There is a lot of constituent players along the uh, the, the, the sort of like the path to, to activation, et cetera, and showing the ad. So at some stage you have to integrate with TCF and work with, it, with existing partners. So how do you work with all those disparate partners if there are literally like thousands of ad tech companies in that, in that sort of uh, ecosystem? It's a great question. Um, I'm just going to be a very simple drawing and then we'll, we'll do things yeah, yeah, yeah. on the timeline. So let's just admit that it's not done. We're working towards it, but there, there is a long way to go. And this is the road. But where we're headed, Kieran, is active consent. It is the concept that users actively consent to everything that's being done with their data. Um, wait, I'm just gonna do active consent. Yeah. Um, okay. That would mean, that means they have to know what's being done. They have to be notified of it. And then they have to agree to it. 
right. not, not, not an easy thing to do, especially if we think about what the walled gardens are driving and how they really do control a lot of the way ad tech is written and, and behave. They don't want to provide this kind of ecosystem. They, they enjoy the benefits of users not understanding the degree to which their data is being monetized. I say yeah. that because if you think about the trillions of dollars that currently sit in those big walled gardens, they are built on you and I doing things on the internet. And mm. is it, have we got, Kieran, have we got a fair exchange of that? Do you and I, did, did you and I get a fair exchange? Do, do we think that, that maybe Google has gotten a little bit more of the value exchange in this thing? I, I, I believe that, it, that, that they have, yes. That, that, that yes, they make great products and yes, they, uh, they deserve to benefit, but there is a value exchange there that I don't think is entirely fair and it needs to be corrected in my view, but active consent, okay. That's where we're headed. Now is TCF 2.0 gonna be the answer for everybody? No, it's gonna have some challenges, but it'll be a part of the way in which we collect and uh, communicate active consent. So our, we're asking all our partners in Europe to build capabilities that are, that are on top of the TCF 2.0. Both vendors who partner together uh, have to have consent. But we also have our own native, uh, native products that, that ask people for consent and, and um, you know, store that, audit it. It's not uh, as, as standardized. So we, we want to dissuade people from using it, but we have it if they don't want that you to use the TCF framework. So we leverage our native products to build consent with our vendors. And then the big deal for me is the global privacy platform out of IAB. I don't know if you've been um, you've been involved there or know about it, but they are they've built or are building uh, the tech lab is building a global privacy uh, platform, which will it's an enormous project, but it takes into account every single country's separate privacy regulation that are on the books today and are might be on the books in the future categorizes them into what needs to be notified for each user and what permission needs to be asked for each user and stores that uh, in a giant spreadsheet. And they are currently thinking of using um, Fibonacci encoding to put all of that into a single string that can be passed with every bid request that ever flows through the system. Mm -hmm. That would mean that no matter what country you're in or what law you're, the jurisdiction of that country makes you do, uh, the the user will get both accountability, transparency, and control worldwide. Huge, huge project, but we're very excited about it and are actively participating in that. So we think these three things uh, will build an active consent future in which uh, users will have accountability, transparency, and control, and, and, and marketers, brand marketers will get value, uh, and the open web will stay free. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's quite interesting using all the, the tools available from the open web and your own technology to make it work. Can you talk a little bit about the, um, you know, identity solutions are pretty, pretty uh, hot as well at the minute, but you guys obviously have built your own. Um, I'm just kind of interested in how that works and how that fits into the conversation we're having around the open web stuff. So, um... You're, you 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 want to know how our how our ID solution works? Yeah, Panorama ID. All right, so Panorama ID is uh, it's people based. It's privacy first, so I'll go into each of these, and it's open to all. You can see the theme here, <laughs> but uh, okay, how is it people based? It is a prediction. We use features that we see uh, from uh, any uh, standard server side call, excuse me, uh, client side call um, to link uh, uh, an individual. Uh, we, we create a probabilistic uh, cluster ID and we probabilistically link cookies, uh, mobile ad IDs, um, and CTV devices. And we actually do customer IDs. Uh, and we link them all together with a certain probability. And based on that probability threshold, you're in the cluster or you are not. That is how it works. It is not. It is a data minimized, non-deterministic ID. Super, super important because 
there, there is a big difference between linking someone's street address and first name and last name together on the open web versus just taking a guess uh, and keeping it pretty lightweight. There's a lot of back and forth legally, ethically, everyone's sort of trying to fight for the, for the, for the right space. They're thinking emails are the only way to go. But one could argue that using someone's personal information as the, even if it's encrypted, means by which to communicate across the internet is a little dangerous, maybe even um, you know, not the best way. So perhaps a lightweight ID that's still consented uh, is the way to go. We'll see. I think that will all shake out. Honestly, Kieran, I think it'll probably be a mixture of multiple ID types will end up working across uh, uh, for different use cases and working together. But ours is probabilistic, individually based cluster. What's important, though, is this privacy first part, which I want to talk about, because I think it's important. When folks look at probabilistic IDs, they get a little worried that we're not privacy compliant. And I'll tell you, we are. In fact, we think we're more so than others. First of all, that whole idea of our user ID module and or our capability will not fire unless we have uh, consent from the user. So we have notification, we have consent, and we can have an auditable trail for that. So you will not be in the graph unless you consented actively on each individual device. I will not, if you consent on your uh, cookie, I do not automatically consent you in for all of the others. I have to win one at a time. Hey, can I put your customer ID in there? Yes. Uh, can I put your CTV device in there? Yes. Can I put your mobile ad ID in there? Yes. I'm going to win each device one by one, and then they get the cluster. The important bit, though, is that if you opt out, Kieran, on any single one of these cluster devices, let's say I go to my mobile phone and I say, Do you know what? I don't want Lotomy to track me. Take me out. Lotomy propagates the opt-out signal through the whole cluster. We are uh, comprehensively uh, uh, propagating the opt-out because we believe by linking them probabilistically, it is our duty to opt out anybody who is probabilistically linked to an opted out device. And where are they opting out? Are they opting out via the TCF or, or, or else just wherever I mean, right now there are a number of ways, you know, there's, there, there's our native solution, there's the TCF string, there's the IAB US privacy string, and then there's a bunch of other uh, opt out, global opt out capabilities. The NAI offers one. Um, I can't remember the acronym for the other one. I believe it's, it has N and A and A, but I can't remember which order they're in. But essentially, you can go to those websites, opt out from the internet global, and we're signed up, and they, they send us an API call, and we opt you out. You can also go to Lotomy's privacy page, obviously, and say, I don't want to be opted out. So there's multiple ways you can opt out. Um, and But every if you do so, we propagate that through our cluster. We'll, we'll, we X out the whole cluster, basically. OK. Interesting, interesting. All right, and then open to all, like I said, open to all. Um, the really important bit that I want everybody to hear, our ID is free. We are not charging publishers, marketers, or anybody to use our identity. We are building the capability to keep the web open and free. We, we believe in a rising tide lifts all boats kind of philosophy. And honestly, if the web stays open and marketers can still spend money on the open web without having to go through Google and Apple. Lotomy does benefit because we, uh, we provide this addressability connectivity data solution that, that, that thrives in a, in, a, in a competitive and open environment. And the, in terms of the results you're seeing, though, I'm, I'm curious, like in this new cookie, this environment, I mean, are the results uh, suffering? I mean, there's been sort of a lot of chat about how, you know, one-to-one -one marketing is going away. And that you know that will have a result on the the sort of performance of programmatic or open web buying, um, and uh, obviously affects measurement as well because you don't have a cookie. <clears throat> but I'm just curious, just from your perspective, what are you seeing currently in in, in the in the sort of cookies environment? Right. So right now, the best way to explain the results would be to break it out by browser. So for those of you who know or don't, that, that a cookies are not supported, third-party cookies are not supported, sorry, they're not supported in Safari, and yeah. they're not supported in Firefox by default. Yeah. But they are supported in Chrome currently. So one can make the assumption that this, it, these are a kind of an, a, a stand-in for a cookie-less environment, and this is the stand-in for a cookie environment. And what's interesting is that, yes, we're seeing somewhere between 20 and 30 percent 
uh, increase of addressability in these environments today. Um, now that's coming from zero. Sorry, that's that is uh, that is thirty percent of the of, of safari traffic is now addressable. Uh, uh, this is in channels that do or do not respect our ID. So we're in early, early days. In our internal tests, not in this. This is campaigns. These are all like these are people, our brand marketers. Um, we saw about uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars spent on tests in Q three. We're looking at five to seven fifty, maybe even a million dollars in campaign testing uh, in Q four. And in campaigns, this is what we saw. So there's a lot of hops to get here, Kieran. Uh, to get to this reach number, you have to go to the SSP, the DSP, et cetera. But we're seeing a pretty consistent 20 to 30% increase in reach across Safari and Firefox. In our internal tests, we see 76% of Safari, but you understand as you get further down, it's, it's hard as it, it's the fidelity is, is we, we assume that we're gonna get there eventually as more of publishers adopt and more DSPs begin to use our ID in the auction. Anyway, that's there. But the really interesting thing is we're also seeing an 11% growth in Chrome today. Uh, that's really interesting. And it has to do with the fact that yesterday's third-party cookie is not today's third-party cookie. This idea that third party, that cookies are persistent, that they you remember them, that you can track me day on day, that's not actually the case. In 11% of the time, we are linking yesterday's cookie to today's cookie and providing additional reach for our marketer clients of 11%. The, the, the aggregate is 26 overall. So if you add uh, the Chrome in, and, the, and the, our reach in Firefox and Chrome, we have an average 26% increase in reach today in, in, in DSP run campaigns uh, worldwide. Uh, is the increase in Chrome uh, down to the fact that people are just piling money into Chrome because it's still got a cookie based, uh, uh, a third party cookie based infrastructure. Well, uh, so let's dig into Chrome because um, it really has to do with, with the browser environment. Yeah. So in Chrome, um, most often, in about 80% of the cases, you'll have a third party cookie that'll remember. It'll be a load of me cookie. Yeah. Okay. Actually, yeah. Let's just assume it's a load of me cookie. It, it may be somebody else's cookie, but the point is there's a third party cookie there. Okay. And that means that there's audience addressability. We can bring audiences to this environment because we know who the user is and we have connected other audience data to it. So we offer audience addressability when there's a third party cookie. And for about 80% of the time, there is one. But for 20% of the time, Karen, yes, it got purged, it got erased, it got deleted, it got, it aged out. Um, there's a number of ways in which a third party cookie will leave a browser. It can get cleared for all sorts of reasons. Mm. And that means that 20% of the Chrome inventory is not addressable with audience addressability. And what our solution does is says, all right, hey user, can I, we ask, can, can we track you? They say, yes, we can. Yes, you can. We make an assessment of whatever we see. Uh, we, we have, you know, IP address, user agent, uh, uh, timestamp. Actually, we don't use user agent. IP, timestamp, and the uh, first party cookie, actually. And we ask them, can we track you? They say, yes, okay. We, we provide a panorama ID to the page. And that panorama ID has audience addressability. And so we add an additional 11% audience addressability to the Chrome page. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes plenty of sense. I, I want to make sure that you that we, we hit on this, that we do not fire this unless we have active consent from the user on the page. Yeah, yeah. It's all about the user being in control of that situation. Um, it, it just, just another question here. It, how far along, like in terms of how the industry's evolved around privacy, are we, are we far off this? I mean, in terms of getting it right, that satisfies all parties in the, on the open web. So I'm talking about GDPR regulators, all the rest of it. I mean, are we close to getting it solved or, or do we have quite a way to go before um, we satisfy that, that sort of privacy requirement? So it depends on who you ask. The, I'll, I'll tell you what, I. 
I have a bias in a certain direction, so I'm looking for confirmation. I have a confirmation bias. I'm looking for those people who agree with me, so I read a lot of people who generally agree with that approach. Um, so I, the way I see it is that the tools are not far off. There's really nothing to draw here. The yeah. tools are not far off. We, meaning the, the, the hard work from the IAB has been, a, a lot of it has been done. We still have engineering stuff to do. But the hard work of gathering all the information across jurisdiction is like a giant group of 60 lawyers, all the sort of internal counsels and outside counsels building a, a framework that would understand every jurisdiction's privacy requirements is done. Then we need to build, we need to figure out the Fibonacci thing where we can encode these giant strings is actually done. That, that's net. So the next thing is to figure out what the, the what the standard for the for the string is. Um, and then release that technical spec to the world and have publishers buy into this concept because really it is about them doing that. I'll tell you what, they are reticent for a lot of different reasons uh, to, to take on another tax in the form of a CMP. That's yeah. not a great thing for them. So we have to figure out that business model. Is it publishers? thing to pay for do they are they the ones who ought to be paying for this or is this marketer should they be paying for the cmp don't know I, I, we have to figure that out and then um once the publishers have gotten behind this concept of a cmp the rest of the system will will, will buy in because there's a there's a ton of money and, and commerce to be made there and if so, it's really not about whether there should be rules at all. It's really about everyone's just waiting for the rules to come down. Like, well, is it, do I drive on this side of the road or that side of the road? Just tell me, because I'll just drive on that side. It's not like we're all pissed off about there being rules. We're just, yeah. we're just waiting for them to come down in some consistent way. Um, and so, gosh, the answer is we're not as close as I'd like to be, uh, but, but we're, we're not far away. But we're, we're getting there. That's the main thing. Uh, Pierre, that was great. Thanks for that run through of, of sort of that that sort of uh, fork in the road and where you guys play a role in the open web. Um, and thanks for bringing us through that. And it's interesting to, to hear where the ad tech industry is and its relationship with the IB Tech Lab and, and using those frameworks to build sort of like uh, a, gr a grand coalition that we all can sort of work towards, which is, which is brilliant. So Pierre, thank you for your time and thank you for doing the spiritual uh, 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 trader talk from New York today. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. We look forward to having you in the office at some stage in the future. Oh, that'd be brilliant. I would love that. Thank you. And that was Trader Talk TV, and we will see you next time. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye.